Hello everyone, my name is Nate Ferguson and this is Yeast Basics 2, Q&A number one. Now, all these questions we're answering today are were all asked during modules one and two. Now, the focus of modules one and two was, to, was a focus on generating happy and healthy beer and yeast cells and how to harvest them. Now, all the subsequent lectures on this will all be about applying these yeast cells. At this point, we've generated happy, healthy yeast cells. The beer we've produced at this point is, is was devoid of flavor, uh, negative flavor compounds, things like that. Going forward, we're looking at how can we repitch these yeast cells to consistently make happy, healthy, high quality beer. But all the questions today are all based on our first two modules, yeast and oxygenation and monitoring fermentation and harvesting yeast cells. Now, before we get into that, I, we've asked, had a few people ask, why are we doing this? And the answer to that is actually pretty easy. It's, it's right in our mission statement. Now, you can find this mission statement on the landing page of our website. Our mission statement is as such. We believe fermentation should be easy. We know that fermentation can be mysterious and stressful. Believe me, for us, when we were first learning this stuff, it was too. To a certain degree, it still is. There's always new things to learn. We know you are curious to learn because you have ambitious fermentation goals. If you didn't, you, wouldn't pro you probably wouldn't be here with us. This is why we are focused on growing yeast you can trust. We help you become fermentation experts, and we listen to your challenges and celebrate your triumphs. The reasons for this video, this video series exists is to help everyone. We are here to try and share our knowledge to the industry as easily as possible so that everyone can benefit. Now, before we get into today, I want to give a big thanks to everyone who uh, pushed questions to us over the last several weeks. These questions have allowed, allowed us to dig into a little bit more, figure out where, where you guys are having challenges, and the answer of these will hopefully help everyone. That's the goal. Figure out what, what one brewery has a problem with, share that information so that everyone can benefit. That's our mission. Really, it's just an externalization of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would want done unto yourself. It's as simple as this. Just add a few of the things into it. Treat others in the planet, and I would add yeast, as you would like to be treated. You just need to figure out how to, do, how to do that. And that's what we're trying to help you guys all do. So today, we are going to be answering your questions. Some of the questions I want to point out here have been cleaned up, refined. We had a few people who would ask, who would ask the same questions. We have tried to homogenize and you know, mix them all into one kind of cleaner statement or cleaner question. So with that, let's jump in. Question number, number one from Pierre-Luc Girard. Sorry if I say anyone's names incorrectly. I'm trying. We usually see a decrease in ABV with increase of wort aeration for the same amount of sugars ingested during the fermentation of the brewery. We usually consider it because, uh, because we create yeast instead of alcohol. So the idea here is that if we're adding more aeration to the wort, are we going to see increased yeast cell biomass and less alcohol? So this is correct. When you add more oxygen, you are going to see more yeast cells being produced. Now, this could be a good thing because we need those yeast cells for subsequent batches. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Where people typically see a negative on this element is they see the decrease in alcohol. Now, in some quick literature checks and just you know, very uh, brief check on this, at max, you're going to see about 0.1 to 0.2 ABV reduction due to the addition of oxygen. In my eyes, this is a pretty easy trade-off. I'm going to lose 0.1 to 0.2% alcohol, but in the, in, in, uh, as a result, I'm going to have a happier, healthier, more flavorful or less, less flavorful if it's negative flavors fermentation. In my mind, this is a clear, cut, easy answer. Yeah, you should keep on aerating. And yes, you're going to see some increased biomass and decreased alcohol content, but you're overall going to be much better off for it. It's a great question. Question number two from Dan Albanus. Again, sorry if I'm saying your names incorrectly. Uh, you mentioned a brewery that was over-oxygenating. What are the impacts of over-oxygenation? This is a two-part question, so we have the next part on the next slide. So the symptoms of over-oxygenation are typically dead yeast cells, poor flavor, and autolysis, which typically results in an increase in beer pH. Now, this is similar, or what's happening here is similar to what happens when you say bite into an apple and then leave the, the now exposed portion of the apple, the white part, uh, open to the environment. It starts to brown, it starts to discolor and degrade. What's happening here is the oxygen is binding to, to, to those portions, in this case for the apple, the sugar, and breaking it down. If we pull out, supply so much oxygen to the yeast cell where it can't bring that oxygen into the cell quickly enough, the, we're going to see the yeast cell degrade. So if we apply too much oxygen to the yeast cell, this is a lot of oxygen to the yeast cell, we will start seeing the, the outsides of the yeast cell oxidize, just like we see a bitten apple start to oxidize. This will damage the yeast cell, typically causing cell death, resulting in an increase in, in a, sorry, a decrease in viability, increase in off flavors, and oftentimes an increase in pH. It's not great. Now again, this is very hard to achieve. It's very hard to achieve, which is the next question. What were they doing wrong? 
What was our oxygenation method? So this is a very unique situation. I want to stress this. This is not something that, in our experience, many breweries are able to pull off. Most breweries struggle with sufficient oxygen. They don't struggle with over aeration. I need to emphasize that. In this situation, they installed the, the cause of this is they installed larger, taller tanks further away from the brew house. So this increase in back pressure due to the longer line lengths uh, increased the O2 solubility due to pressure and contact time was longer in this hose. Because the tank was taller, we have increased pressure pushing down, which then further increases uh, O2 solubility. To go back to the previous lecture, look at Henry's Law, it's all in there they had a perfect storm for adding more oxygen. Now to, sol to solve this, you have two solutions. You can either decrease your O2 rate. You can instead of saying going two liters or eight liters per minute, you can bring it down. Another option here is to switch from oxygen gas to compressed air. Now make sure if you're using this from your air compressor, make sure it's, you know, the oil is removed, your water is removed, make sure it's going through a sterile air filter, all those good things. I would even recommend that your normal sterile uh, compressed air, the uh, compressed oxygen, you should put it through an air, uh, an air filter. Now, due to the lower O2 content of, of compressed air, you can add the same amount of oxygen with the same, same equipment, and it's going to work. Less O2 is applied per minute, therefore we're going to have less aeration, which is actually what this brew, I believe, ended up doing. Now, one other benefit for this is that non-oxygen non gases, such as nitrogen, argon, CO2, will actually create convection. They call, they create what's called an air elevator and mix and churn all the different fills that were going into this fermenter. This is what the big, you know, uh, Molson Coors, Budweiser, the macro breweries do. They're usually going three fills to a fermenter, sometimes more, sometimes less, but usually three. Uh, and they'll use compressed air to help churn all the different fills into one homo uh, hom homogenous mixture. Also make sure that your yeast cells and the cases like that stay, or sorry, are evenly distributed throughout the entire tank. There's a lot of benefits to it. If you find yourself in this situation, my gut would be switched from pure oxygen gas into compressed air, and then dial it in from there. Uh, Francis Rich, uh, I use static mixers on my mash and sparge water mixers. And I was wondering about using it for the wort. Thanks for the answer. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Try it. Uh, the goal of a static mixer is to ensure everything is nice and, you know, homogeneity is complete and everything's done mixing. Uh, full disclosure, we use these things in our process to make sure that everything is homogenous. They work phenomenally well for this. We, we, we have experiences for liquids. So, uh, for like salts and things like that. Now we are in the next couple of weeks uh, going to be doing some internal testing on some static mixtures just to see how we can uh, see how much impact they have when it comes to getting more DO into your wort. Uh, stay tuned for those and we're hope, hoping to have some data for you uh, in the near future. Question four, Josh Kim, will turbulent flow wort transfers possibly diminish the foam or head retention? This is a really good question and I have to make sure I'm clear about this. I'm speaking a little bit out of my expertise on here. I would really want to make sure you have someone who has who knows a bit more more about this. But here's my thoughts on it. It could we could see a decrease in foam production and retention on this. But I think overall net you're going to be in the positive. Reasons for this: when we over aerate our wort, which we're going to see more when we, when we have turbulent flow, or just not, not over aerate when you have sufficient aeration, we're going to see the yeast cells secrete less proteases. Uh, which means that we're going to have more of the head retention, uh, formation retention proteins, mainly being proteins that an LTP1 uh, and other analog molecules to them, present inside of the beer. So because the yeast cells are happy and healthy, they're not going to degrade these proteins, which means we'll probably see an overall net increase in head retention and formation. We'll probably, I would imagine we'd see some breakdown due to turbulent flow, but I think the overall net is probably going to be significantly positive. Again, I would really want someone else who has knows a bit more about foam. There are foam chemists out there. I would want to consult with one of them before giving you a kind of a concrete uh, answer. Question five from Alex Bullock. Uh, delayed sulfur production in Saison yeast, clean for a day, then a big sulfur tone. Is this, is this under oxygenation? It likely could be. Now, sulfur is produced for a few different mechanisms in the yeast cell, but one of them, one of them is fan degradation, so free amino nitrogen degradation. This occurs when the amino acid, when, when you have an amino acid present, and then the nitrogen is stripped off, leaving whatever is left uh, in, the, in the amino acid left. We covered this in Yeast Basics One. Uh, this is how we get some sulfur compounds inside of beer. Now, in any industry, the enemy of sulfur is oxygen. Sulfur binds to oxygen very quickly. So this being the result of a lack of oxygen is very plausible, even just from a cleanup standpoint. Uh, if we give the yeast cells more energy as well, they may, they may not have to use these sulfur-contained amino acids as, as readily, which could also result in some uh, a decrease in sulfur compounds. 
Now, there are some other ways to kind of mechanically get around this, though. There are a handful. This is one of the reasons why you see a lot of Saison makers like wide, shallow fermenters. When, when, the, when the sulfur gas has to travel through, say, six feet of liquid versus several stories tall, it's a lot easier for that sulfur to flash off. One thing that's really important to note when it comes to sulfur, sulfur is a gas in, in almost all situations. It is a gaseous compound, which means that it, the solubility rules apply just like they would for oxygen or for CO2. So the taller the tank, the more partial pressure of the sulfur gas I'm going to have inside the solution. Therefore, the harder it is to flash off. If I have a wider, shallow tank, I'm going to have less pressure inside that liquid, less hydrostatic pressure, which means Henry's law will be less complete, which means I'm going to have easier flash off of compounds. Larger, larger shallow containers also have a greater access to oxygen. There's a lot of reasons for, for this uh, setup. Great question. Dave, how different is pressure fermenting in a homebrew environment versus a professional in terms of yeast stress? So this depends on pressure, and I just want to break this out quickly. So CO2 pressure, it's not very different. CO2 is CO2. Now there's some uh, I'd say mixed literature on this. CO2 in general is thought to be not very toxic for yeast cells. That's a pretty standard standard uh, viewpoint. Um, what is too much pressure versus not enough pressure and whether and how much this is strain dependent is currently up, up for debate. Uh, in my perspective, if we're looking kind of a, a pros and cons situation on this, if you're looking for a yeast cell, yeast cell health standpoint, there's no benefit from adding pressure to the yeast cells. There's only potential negatives. So I would, if you're trying to store yeast cells or things like that, get them off. If you're doing a pressurized fermentation, try to get the yeast cells out of that tank as quickly as possible, just so that we don't we can remove that stressor. It may not do anything, but if it does, we're covered for it. Now this has that that's CO2 pressure. If you look at hydrostatic pressure, which is the physical pressure of the liquid on top, that's very different. You know, there are no home brewers. I don't think there's any home brewers who are fermenting in, in uh, devices that are several stories tall. We have all that liquid pushing down on the tank. I, th I believe it's um, one, sorry, 10 meters equals one bar, 14.5 PSI of pressure, which isn't nothing, but it's going to stress them out a little bit. Now, what you see some breweries have problems with this for, and this is something that you see uh, some home brewers have problems when they go pro or some pro breweries have issues with when they expand is that new taller tanks, the beer typically ferments at a slower rate due to this increased hydrostatic pressure. This typically results in a cleaner beer. Now this can be a good thing, this can be a bad thing. It's just a, it's just an, uh, a variable you have to deal with or you, you have to balance out. If you are in the situation where you've, you've installed a new tank, your beer is becoming clean and you wanna make it, you know, say more, more expressive, the easiest way to do that is to increase the fermentation temperature. Question seven, uh, Dan Albanus. Uh, if you're bottom cropping yeast early-ish in fermentation, do you run the risk of selecting for lower attenuation, higher flocculation yeast cells? Um, should you? Should I be worried about genetic drift? Now, I'm struggling to give a concrete answer on this question for two reasons. So the core of the question here is, will, will I apply selective pressure onto my yeast by cropping them early? We'll go through the two reasons. The first reason I, the first reason I have some issues answering this question directly is that we have a handful of clients who are struggling to repitch, meaning in, I, when I say struggling to repitch, they're struggling to get 10, more than 10 gens out of their yeast cells. That's one of the main reasons why I made this series is to help answer and address this problem. Now, if you're only going through 10 generations, the amount of pressure you're applying via genetic drift is not that large. I'm not really worried about it, if, if that's the case. Um, there just simply aren't enough repetitions to try and go through it. Now, if you're struggling to get 10, that's likely due to your yeast cells being stressed out, um, you may think you're getting genetic drift, but you're probably just seeing cell degradation. That's the important bit. So genetic drift only happens typically when the yeast cells are happy and healthy between each batch. If they're not happy and healthy, you're probably just seeing degradation qualities. Reason two is that the how clean the stratification between early flock and late flock and most craft-sized uh, fermentations is up for debate. Um, now, just intuitively, you would think that the yeast cells that settle early would be lower attenuative. This intuitively makes sense, um, but from anecdotal evidence, uh, just from chatting with brewers, it doesn't really seem to pan out. These yeast cells seem to flock out because they're nice, they're happy, they're healthy, have lots of nutri internal nutrient reserves. They're they're good, they're done. Um, they don't see this doesn't seem to pan out how you'd expect it to. Now, I, I need to point one big thing out: this, there does need to be a lot of research in this, a lot more research. Uh, but the fact that we can harvest high viability or increased viability in health cells early in fermentation suggests that the yeast cells are flocked out because 
they're, they're, they've reached maximum nutrient density. They're not going to reproduce anymore, and it's probably more the daughter cells that are floating around finishing off the beer. I'm, that's, I'm speaking strictly anecdotally, and there's no research on this. We need more research on that exact element. So this is strictly hypothetical at that point. Now, I want to do put one, put one thing here. I have never come across a brewery that has selected for under attenuation via cropping. I haven't had it. I've never seen a brewery that through, you know, 10 or 20 generations or 30 generations has selected for a v- variety of their culture that is less attenuative. I've seen ones that are more attenuative where the attenuation has cropped up from batch to batch to batch. That's pretty rare um, for most strains. There's a few strains where it happens to a bit more commonly, mainly Cali. Uh, but that, and, and half the time, that's usually a cross-contamination with something they didn't know they had. Um, so I don't think you have to worry a ton about this, especially if you're trying to shoot for 20, 25 generations. I wouldn't really be worried about it. I'd focus more so on making sure that your yeast cells are nice, happy, and healthy. Great question. Question eight. Uh, Miles Van Warmer, this is a three-part question. Uh, on the first video, you talked about aerobic phase for yeast. How much does this apply to yeast during beer production conditions? Great question. Beer is, an, is almost always an anaerobic environment. So I want to tweeze out some detail here. This aerobic respiration applies completely here, but it doesn't occur in the same way that you might think human cells operate. So for us, we're constantly breathing, inhaling, inhaling. (sighs) We're always going through aerobic respiration. Now, yeast cells like us can go through anaerobic respiration. If you're going to the gym, you're depleting your your cells of, uh, of oxygen, they will go into anaerobic respiration. They'll produce lactate or lactic acid inside of your muscles. That's what happens when you push your muscles really hard. They start burning, they start burning glucose and turn it into lactic acid. This is because they've started to run out of oxygen. Yeast cells will kind of do the inverse. Yeast cells will keep on producing alcohol even if they have sufficient oxygen available to them. Yeast cells will always produce alcohol, but they will. But they, if you give them oxygen, they will produce large amounts of energy through aerobic respiration. Now, this has a name. It's called the, tr- the crab tree effect. If you want to go into more detail, I'd recommend you look into it. The cells will produce much more energy when you expose them to oxygen, but they're still going to be producing alcohol at the same time. They don't do one, and they don't finish all aerobic, then switch over to anaerobic. Just like our cells don't go through aerobic, and then once we're pushing ourselves hard, switch to anaerobic. Much like, much like uh, human cells, yeast cells will do both. It's a great question. Part two, do you guys know, of, uh, you guys know or have any studies on O2 intrusion into open fermentations? Frustratingly, no. Um, open fermentation hasn't really been researched that much. There's tons of anecdotal evidence that, that suggests this, but the kind of minutia and the uh, mechanics of it aren't, pr- pr- uh, other than theoretical, aren't well understood. There aren't many... Uh, breweries that have had you know an engineer come in and look at the you know the ebbs and flows and currents that occur. Uh, ha- that being said, if there is a paper or resource out there, I would love for anyone to share it with me and send it my way. I might do a presentation on it if there is. Uh, and part three, clients that had under aeration problems, were they using sterile air or pure oxygen? Cases for both. On the last video you mentioned in 24-hour check for a yeast concentration. How would this be different for ale and lager yeast? So most of our clients use O2 gas. Unless you're seeing over aeration, I think O2 gas is the, it does make the most sense and is the way to go. Um, st- compressed air is, there's a few breweries that will use it, especially if you're doing multi fill fermentation to try and rouse everything together and add a little bit of oxygen. But in general, I think O2 gas is the way to go. Um, there are some breweries that will purge their lines with O2 gas. Uh, and I think that's kind of a waste, personally. I think you should probably have a, an, a compressed air line there just for purging lines and things like that and not use oxygen. Um, that can be a big benefit. And regarding the 24-hour checks, 24 hours is probably a good check, but if, if we could add some ranges to this to make it a bit more accurate, I would probably want to see all cells in suspension for ales between 12 and 36 hours, and for lagers, 24 to 48 hours. 24 is in both, but you know that's probably a bit more accurate if we want to break it out into generalities. And the final question today is question nine from Ant- Antoine Robin. Uh, again, sorry if I'm saying names incorrectly. Uh, if you crop early, do you still crop from the true bottom or cropping through the racking arm facing down? Would that make sense? Um, I've done both. I have some experience cropping from racking arms. I've predominantly cropped from the bottom of the tank, and I always recommend cropping from the bottom of the tank, especially if you're cropping early. Um, just because at this point, all, everything shouldn't, nothing should be stuck to the sides of the, of the tank walls. Everything should flow nicely into that bottom port. Now, one thing I did not mention in, in the lecture four is that you should always drop the trub. You should, if you have, you know, any sort of, any sort of hot or cold break present in there, if you had any whirlpool hops that made their way into the fermenter, you should drop those before you start harvesting. 
always best practice. And in my experience, the bottom port is always recommended. It's, I haven't found a brewery where the racking arm, in my mind, makes sense. If that's your process, don't don't. If it ain't broken, don't fix it. Uh, but in my experience, I usually prefer to go for the bottom port. And just kind of some final thoughts. Uh, just I just wanted to reiterate this because I think this is really important. The reason for creating this series has been to address some of the issues we see our clients struggle with. Um, I know there have been some people when they when you start telling them or giving them advice, they can get defensive. Um, when they find out that something can be better or what they're doing what they're doing or seeing isn't normal. And this is fine. This is completely normal. Um, everything we could go through here, every, everything we talked about in these lectures is, is our recommendation. We can kind of take it or see it as uh, take it as you see fit. Our goal here is to help you guys make better beer. And I, I hope everyone who's uh, who's watched this and enjoyed these series is uh, has gleaned some things that can they can apply into the brewery to improve their process. And with that, that's a wrap for today. I want to say thanks to everyone for tuning into the first half of Yeast Basics 2. It's been a blast making them for everyone. And next week, we're going to start the second half of Yeast Basics 2, all about applying all these, these yeast cells and how we can ensure a culture stays happy and healthy throughout its use. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>